Biz Podcast delivers tea news that you need to know. A recap of the week's major headlines with commentary and cultural trends hosted by Dan Bolton. It is the voice of origin for tea professionals and enthusiasts worldwide. Think of us as a digital caravan of storytellers bringing authentic, authoritative, exotic, and exclusive stories to you weekly from the tea lands. Each week, the Tea Biz Podcast summarizes news with the greatest impact on the tea industry. But tea requires far more nuanced coverage than the recitation of production volumes and commodity prices. That is why the Tea Biz Podcast is paired with the more inclusive Tea Biz blog and Tea Journey magazine. The podcast offers a weekly mix of news and features. It is innovative and interactive permitting listeners to conveniently contact reporters at Origin to ask questions that are answered via text messages that are delivered privately to their phone. Welcome. Here are the headlines. Earth Day takes on new urgency. Restaurants are rebounding. World Tea Expo co-locates with the nightclub and bar show in Las Vegas. And Bubble Tea Boba is languishing at sea. More in a minute, but first, this important message. Avani empowers rural women practicing sustainable agriculture, including tea and crafts, such as weaving with natural fiber and plant-based dyes. Up in the towering Himalayas, Kuman is one of India's oldest tea regions. Today, we raise our cups in the name of Avani Kuman, a nonprofit dedicated to strengthening farming communities. Cheers to a brighter future for all. To donate, visit avani cumanorg Tea Crafts Nigel Mellican in the UK predicts that before the year 2050, the tea industry will be struggling to maintain volume on less land and with less labor and with far higher input costs for scarce resources. Progress is slow, but there are initiatives underway to address climate change worthy of celebrating on this Earth Day. In Assam, India, the Jalinga Tea Estate is building a zero-emission factory capable of processing millions of kilos annually, a first in that country. The estate is partnering with Atmosphere, a German non-profit, committed to reducing CO2 emissions by promoting, developing, and financing renewable energy products and projects in more than 15 countries. In the U.S., Bigelow Tea, which produces 2 billion tea bags annually, relies on solar and renewable energy sources for 100% of its energy requirements. The company is certified as a zero-waste landfill, and owns electric vehicles. Climate volatility resulting in floods, drought, hail damage, increased pests, and reduced yields is apparent in China, India, and East Africa, according to Melikan. Quote, Sustainability is the goal, he says, but I fear sustainability may be severely challenged by upcoming events. Business Insight. U.S. President Joe Biden challenged the U.S. to cut greenhouse gas emissions by half before 2030, reversing controversial policies of the previous administration. America will resume its role as a global leader in halting potentially catastrophic climate change, Biden told member nations at a virtual climate summit this week. Quote, The signs are unmistakable, the science is undeniable, and the cost of inaction keeps mounting, said Biden, adding that the countries that make decisive actions now will be the ones that reap the clean energy benefits of the boom that's coming, end quote. Learn more on the T-Biz blog. The U.S. economy is rebounding with 90% of restaurants open nationally. Revenue at fast food outlets has returned to pre-pandemic totals. 
food delivery and third-party ordering are growing and here to stay, but wait staff may be wearing COVID masks for a very long time, according to Jack Lee, principal at Data Central Market Research. A year after lockdowns began, the resilience of the restaurant sector is apparent as approximately 90% remain open. Permanent closures as of April 2021 are 10.7% nationally, with 2% temporarily closed. The closure rate is now evenly distributed across the country as both urban and rural areas contend with the virus. Initially, city centers were hardest hit, and that remains true with 14.3% of urban locations closed. Metro areas Miami, Portland, Oregon, New York, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. report the most permanent closures. Combined, these markets are home to 120,144 restaurants, of which about 12.5% are permanently closed. Rural and suburban restaurants fared better with closure rates of 11.2 and 11.6, respectively, in zip codes with at least 100 restaurants. Business Insight The greatest disparity in closures is at the local level. Closures rose to and remain at 48% in San Francisco's Embarcadero and 45% in the Financial District. 42% of the restaurants in the Chicago Loop closed, along with 40% in Minneapolis and in South Boston. New York City closures totaled 35% in Manhattan, and Gramercy Flatiron. In contrast, 95% of the restaurants in cities, including Mesquite, Texas, and Williamsport, Pennsylvania, Findlay, Ohio, and Virginia Beach, Virginia, remained open all year. The World Tea Expo Plus Conference will return to Las Vegas June 28th to 30th, Co-locating the events offers new opportunities for business growth and evolution in addition to expanding the audience reach and encouraging innovation and new business partnerships, according to Tim McLucas, Vice President of Questex Bar and Restaurant. In recent years, the World Tea Expo, which was founded in 2003, attracted 3,500 attendees down from a peak of 5,500. The nightclub and bar convention and trade show, now in its 36th year, features 60 educational sessions with six in-depth workshops. The 2020 event is expected to draw 40,000 attendees. Early registration fees are $99. A bubble tea catastrophe is brewing at sea. The black tapioca pearls, known as boba, that are essential to the experience are in short supply, pitting consumers against food service outlets. Due to lockdowns, many bubble tea drinkers were forced to make their favorite treat at home, ordering the ingredients in bulk online. Sweet syrup, milk, and tea are readily available, but packages of Buddha bubbles boba and Wu Fu Wan Boba to cook at home, all shipped from Asia. The favored port of call is Los Angeles, where an average of 30 ships a day are anchored and idling, waiting to unload. As shops reopen, managers ordering direct from Asian suppliers find consumer shipments clogging the supply chain. Along the East Coast, arrivals were delayed by the obstruction of the Suez Canal. Further complicating supply is a drought in Taiwan that led to government orders curtailing water use by boba manufacturers. Taiwan is the hub of boba production globally. T-Zone, one of the largest U.S. suppliers in Bubble Tea Canada, reports shortages of the most popular boba balls due in part to over-orders and hoarding. Biz Insight 
The global market for boba tea is predicted to increase by 963 million by 2023, according to market research firm Technavio. The annual average growth rate is accelerating at 7%. Asia dominates, but Europe and Middle East are experiencing 38% growth. New outlets are expanding availability, and that's fueling demand. Kung Fu Tea, the largest U.S. boba chain, currently operates 250 locations and expects to open 70 more in 2021. The crop outlook in India is increasingly bleak due to drought-like conditions since March in both Assam and West Bengal. Arvinda and Antharaman in Mengaluru brings us this week's tea price report. India Price Watch for the week ending April 17, 2021. Sale 15 was a quiet week in the auctions, even as the second wave of COVID rages across the country and elections are ongoing in many tea growing states. Incidentally, neither the weather nor the prices saw much change from last week. This was also the week of the Lunar New Year celebrated in several parts of the country. Guwahati auctions were closed as the state celebrated Bihu. Kolkata auctions saw another week of lower than expected sales for CTC. While Orthodox leaf and dust did better, there was no Darjeeling on offer. In Kochi, there was good demand for Orthodox leaf and CTC leaf with about 80% of the offerings sold. Demand for Orthodox leaf was from exporters to CIS countries and the Middle East while the local market was in play for CTC leaf. However, the absence of supply code, the biggest buyer for the third week running, has impacted CTC dust prices. Only 59% on offer was sold. Prices for the top end Nilgiri's whole leaf was down from sale 14. This is seen as partly market correction as more teas are arriving from the gardens and buyers are willing to wait for better quality, but it also points to a subdued market against COVID. The prices were not significantly different from sale 14. In Kunur, a limited quantity of green tea was on offer and all sold. And now, a word from our sponsor. Q Trade Teas works with tea purveyors at every scale. From promising startups to the world's largest multinational beverage brands in the hot, iced, and bottled tea segments. With U.S.-based formulation, blending, and packaging services, Q-Trade can help you innovate, scale up, and grow your specialty tea brand. For more information, visit our website, qtradetees.com. This week, T-Biz travels to the famed Royal Botanic Garden at Kew to explore a prized collection of 174-year-old tea recently examined and cataloged for its organoleptic properties. And we visit Paris to learn how the Agency for the Promotion of Agricultural Product, AVPA, elevates the world's tea origins. Rediscovering 174-year-old tea. In 2020, the Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew began analyzing the provenance of more than 300 tea specimens, mainly Chinese and Indian-grown teas dating to the 1850s. Researcher Aurora Prain began by examining labels. She then proceeded to record non-textual evidence experienced through sight, touch, and smell. She joins us today to share her findings and some new insights into the work of horticulturist Robert Fortune, whose specimens are included in the collection. Will you share with our listeners what it's like to examine tea from 1853? The collection is quite old. So the leaves are different shades of brown. Of course, they're oxidized, but the different shapes expose different tea types. Compression was a major theme, which surfaced right away, as well as a whole slew of different orthodox shaped leaves. I didn't touch them directly without gloves um, and did it very sparingly to preserve them. But rotating the jars exposed different labels that were hidden and even bits of metal that were stamped labels, as well as a little bit of a tea chest. We all know tea absorbs scent. I was shocked to have smell white tea and pick up on some nuance as well as some oolong. Even greens, smelling some greens, the leaves are now brown, 
Um, but you can tell that there's still that green heart there. Yak butter has a very interesting, distinct smell and a wooden container, 175 years old, is still a little bit uh, pungent in the collection. As far as how the collection tastes, well, <laughs> maybe one day if, if Mark allows, I would love to try. The storied horticulturalist and plant hunter Robert Fortune is part of the narrative. He was not working for Q, but some of the specimens that he collected ended up in the museum. Will you briefly describe his adventures? His story is really fascinating. I read a wonderful biography by Alistair Watt that really covers his whole life and career. And he's a horticulturist by training and is a plant hunter like many horticulturists and, plant and uh, scientists at the time. And he traveled to Asia, mainly China, on five different expeditions between 1843 and 1861. And he was hired first by the Horticultural Society of London and then the East India Company, traveled on behalf of the U.S. government. He also collected insects and different antiquities. So he did write extensively about his work, mainly in the Gardener's Chronicle, as well as a journal of the Horticulture Society of London. And he also wrote five larger publications or books uh, corresponding to his different expeditions. And the map that you see in the article um, came from one of them, which just shows so much. And the different principal areas I, I find very, very interesting because it was what was believed at the time, of course, so it doesn't show the experimental test plots in Beijing or in South India. And uh, the area of Assam that we know that grows tea, as seen in the map, is where the indigenous variety of Samaka, as you know it today, was quote-unquote discovered. And now that whole, the growing area of Assam is, is a lot larger. We know that Korea has been growing tea for hundreds of years and they're left off the map. It's, it's a really quite interesting. So we have two artifacts in the collection from Fortune, and one of which is a set of paintings on pith paper that was requested by the collection's founder, William Jackson Hooker, um, because he was in the process of writing about and describing the plant used to make that paper. So I think the paper itself was slightly more of interest than the depictions. And then the second was the, this fancy or twisted tea that came in 1983, actually, and, but was collected in 1852. And it came from Yunnan, where Fortune wasn't traveling, so it was likely collected from a port. Q hosted multiple workshops in January 2020 for members of the tea community from the UK and Ireland prior to closing the gardens during the pandemic. Aurora, how can listeners learn more about this marvelous collection? The way that people can reach out and, and engage with this collection is through the online catalog available on Q's website. If you search Economic Botany Collection, by just type in Camellia and you'll be able to have it. One of the real remarkable things about this collection is how intact it is. The highlights I identified for the workshops we hosted in January 2020 are some of the same objects almost to a T, that were identified in the 1850s, and they're still here and still intact. And this is what's really pushing me to keep going uh, remotely and, and during this pandemic, because I know that listeners and tea nerds around the world are really just going to love it. There's going to be even more coming out of this project. The Paris-based AVPA, Agency for the Promotion of Agricultural Products, is allied with tea producers globally. Recognition, professional education programs, and competitions build self-esteem and economic recognition that directs a larger share of the value chain to the country of origin. Quote, This is why we cling to local transformation of agricultural products so that producers benefit from the pursuit of excellence, says AVPA President Philippe Juglar. Juglar kindly shared a portion of his day to explain how competitions that exclude international judges in favor of local experts reveal what the gastronomic world thinks and what the professional tea world thinks about quality tea lead to some very interesting differences. 
tea consuming nations have many reasons to support tea suppliers at origin. Name the most compelling of these regions from the vantage of AVPA and describe your process of evaluating tea with French only judges. We are trying to create contact between European distributors and possible suppliers. Possible suppliers in new countries, for instance, new uh, tea producer in Eastern Africa, they are absolutely unknown up to now. They have no image. So we want the, fr- the French and European tea distributors uh, to have contact with new countries of production and new producer. Bearing in mind that tea market is mainly global uh, uh, international companies or very large trading companies. The imports, the qualities and the quantities they want. We try to uh, precisely define the parameters we want to judge. And we check that all our judges in the jury agree on the measurement of those parameters. Second, we try to group the products in homogeneous categories. We don't want to compare what is not comparable, but just to have a comparable notation for products which are, let's say, similar. Third, very paradoxical, we wish not to have an international jury. Testing is very, how to put it, I would say related to our culture. And the result is not very interesting because the jury is wishing to have a, a, a result which is a consensus when we want to have and really to find out the very interesting product. And for that, I would say also that uh, to have a common language is very, very important. Uh, to try to say in your mother long- language what you feel is difficult, but in a foreign language, is nearly impossible. So we try to compare what the gastronomic world thinks and what the professional world thinks. And I can assure you that we find very interesting difference. Quality is visible to all. Color, pluck, and the precision of leaf preparation and style, and the absence of defects such as oxidation of the leaves. Taste, however, is subjective. Yet skilled tea tasters agree that certain teas possess exceptional characteristics. Please explain AVPA's gastronomic approach in evaluating tea. Do you know how we judge wine in France? The best wine of a certain region, certain area, is the wine which, which, which is the nearer of the uh, fetten of the wine of this region. So you have an organoleptic profile for, for instance, such region of Burgundy. And the best wine of this specific region of Burgundy is the wine which will get a profile which is the nearest of the theoretical one, which is completely intellectual. Huh? And we never compare two wines from two different regions. That is a nonsense. There is no interest in that. We are not we are not looking in a wine from Provence what we are looking from a wine from Loire. If we speak of coffee, if we speak of chocolate, if we speak of uh, uh, other products, uh, we are wishing to help local transformation of the uh, raw product. Second reason to obtain exceptional qualities when the processing of the agricultural product is made by the grower himself or the nearest possible from the grower, you get exceptional products. The case with wine. It's the case with olive oil. Why for? Because you change your grower in a passionate degustator of his own product. And his reaction is completely different. And there is no discussion. You just want to have the best with the best practice. The third reason that uh, uh, in producing country now, you have emerging markets and why to import from uh, America, from Europe. Tea is, by definition, processed in uh, growing countries. So, and, and that may be the reason of uh, that those exceptional teas you have in China or in Japan, because they have processed their own teas during thousands of years. 
Consumer Preferences Power Markets, AVPA, educates and helps inform tea selection by consumers. Will you share your thoughts on the importance of traceability and delivering a fair price to those at origin? Traceability for me is very, very important because what the consumer is looking for is to know the family, the region, where the product is coming from. And nowadays you have on the market uh, coffee sachets or tea sachets uh, with a code which will allow you to have a picture uh, of the very farm where the product has been grown. And that leads to a notion you know perfectly, which is geographical indication. A lot of these small producers have no, have not the financial means to get a brand, a trademark. But if they are grouping themselves, themselves, they can get a geographical indication. And that's uh, the, 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 the way we do in Italy or in France, or maybe, maybe in Japan. Uh, a lot of very good products are known by their geographical indication. And geographical indication is a way to get that intangible value uh, which will transform the life of, of, the, of the tea growers. Now, as, as far as fair, pro, fair price is concerned, uh, for me, it's a very, very difficult notion, maybe because I'm a bit old, but I don't really believe that you bu- built a, 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 a regular commercial uh, relation uh, based on the fact that one uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, the dealer is a poor guy, uh, I, I, I saw it very well in coffee. Uh, if I am poor, I can sell my coffee. If by selling my coffee I become rich, I cannot sell it anymore. And the second problem, the second problem, what is a fair price? Cost of living is not at all the same in Sri Lanka, in China, in uh, Colombia, uh, or in Canada. So. The notion of fair price is very good, and it's a, for me, it's a concept developed in developed countries, in consumer countries. And frankly speaking, uh, I, I did very uh, deep st- studies for coffees, and I can tell you that over one dollar gained by the fair pre- by the fair price logo, ninety percent of it stay in Europe. So I prefer to help the farmer to get a a, a natural good value by the quality and by the fact that his brand or the geographical indication is renowned by the consumer better than by an act of charity. Intrigued by what you heard in today's podcast? Would you like to learn more from our global network of T-Biz journalists and tea experts? Contact them direct through Subtext, a private message-based platform. Avoid the chaos of social media and start a conversation that matters. Subtext's message-based platform lets you privately ask meaningful questions of the tea experts, academics, and T-Biz journalists reporting from the tea lands. You see their responses via SMS texts, which are sent direct to your phone. Visit our website and subscribe to Subtext to instantly connect with the most connected people in tea. Remember to visit the T-Biz website for more comprehensive coverage. That's www.t-bizbiz.com. Thanks for listening. Farewell till next week.